and welcome to our video on speciation here in our evolution unit of the course. So it's probably pretty clear that these two gentlemen are members of different species. I hope it's clear at least. Probably less clear that these folks are members of different species, but they are. And so that's really what we're going to talk about here is what is a species and how do they occur? So here in this video, we're going to talk about this notion of the biological species concept. We're going to talk about the barriers that keep different species from being the same species. And we'll talk about some examples of speciation. So here's the phylogenetic tree that separates these three individuals. We can see their splits and the splits between the two on the left is more recent, but still everybody's a different species. So let's get our head around this notion of a biological species. A biological species is just a group of individuals that can successfully reproduce. Our friends the chimpanzees or our friends the bonobos or our friends the human beings were all members of different species because we only reproduce with other members of our particular biological group. That is this concept. It's not a perfect definition, but what's nice about this definition is that it's testable. If you can reproduce with another organism, you're part of the same species. If not, you can't. It's a definition that we can apply when we're investigating speciation, but I'm not going to tell you that something as complex as speciation is can be so simply boiled down that we don't find marginal examples or difficulty applying this in certain situations. But still, this is the definition that we focus on here in this course. The idea here being reproductive isolation. You can't reproduce with anybody who isn't a member of your own species. There's two different ways that speciation can happen. There's allopatric speciation and sympatric speciation. Let's do allopatric speciation first. I've gone once again to our hypothetical population of smileys. And so allopatric really just means other country. And what's going to happen here is some sort of barrier is going to form that's going to separate these two populations from each other. In this case, it's a river. And once those two populations are physically separated from each other, they no longer reproduce with each other. Differences can start to accumulate from one population to the next. And in this case, you can see that our population over on the right has undergone a series of genetic changes, which have really changed their appearance and made them markedly different. If that barrier disappears or those two populations are able to get back together for whatever reason in the future, if enough changes have accumulated, then these two species will no longer reproduce with each other. They have become separate species. That's this notion of allopatric speciation. No matter how close we bring them, if they won't reproduce with each other anymore, they are separate species. Sympatric speciation is a little bit different. Sympatric means in the same place or the same country. This is going to occur where the speciation event happens even though the population is still in contact with each other. For whatever reason, a series of changes occur in some individuals of this population that cause them to be reproductively isolated from the other population and as a result, they are now separate species. Even though they were never physically separated, they're still reproductively isolated from each other by the time that they've changed. That's this notion of allopatric and sympatric speciation. If we really want to get down and see what's happening at the level of the biology of what contributes to a species forming, we need to think about species barriers. In order to successfully reproduce, sperm and egg have to come together to make a zygote, and that's the cell that you see here. This is the first cell produced when sperm and egg are fused. That event is crucial for reproduction for obvious reasons. To consider what's happening with speciation, it's probably best to think about a series of things that prevent this fusion of sperm and egg from ever happening. These are your species barriers. And the ones that happen before the sperm and the egg come together are called prezygotic barriers. And you can see them there. We'll go through each one in turn. They all prevent sperm and egg from meeting up. And even after sperm and egg meet up, there are a couple of things that can happen to the offspring that prevent that offspring from being able to successfully reproduce itself. In that case, it's still considered a speciation event because the offspring can't reproduce. And those would be our post zygotic barriers. So we'll go into each one in turn and talk about them. The first of our prezygotic barriers are habitat isolation. The American toad and Fowler's toad, their habitats actually overlap, but 
One is reproductively active in the spring and the other is reproductively active in the late summer or fall. And since they are reproductively active at different times of the year, they do not reproduce with each other. They're reproductively isolated. And as a result, they are separate species. That's our habitat or our temporal isolation. It's easy to understand why two species couldn't reproduce with each other if they lived in different places, but you know, very similar to that is living in the same place but active at different times. Our next prezygotic barrier is behavioral isolation. This is where the different species act in different ways so that they don't reproduce with each other. I've spotlighted here the blue-footed boobies and red-footed boobies of the Galapagos Islands who have uh, elaborate mating dances. Here is the blue-footed booby engaged in its sky-pointing dance. And as a result, they do not reproduce with each other because they are behaviorally very different from each other. Our next prezygotic barrier is mechanical isolation. In this situation, the reproductive apparatus of the different organisms does not fit together or does not come into contact, cannot come into contact with each other, I think is probably the best way to think about it. It's probably pretty obvious when we're considering like a crayfish and an elephant. We won't get too much further into that. But I would also like to point out that we see this a lot in flowers. So each of these flowers has uh, adapted to a different pollinator to attract a different pollinator. And so as a result, they're effectively mechanically isolated from each other because they will use different pollinators. These are all various orchid species. And the last of our prezygotic barriers are the isolation mechanisms that prevent sperm from coming together with egg, even if they're in the same place. So a good example of this is coral on a coral reef, a lot of different species of coral. They all reproduce the same way. They make their gametes and they send them off into the water that surrounds them. But what prevents one species gametes from getting together with another species gametes? In order for sperm and egg to come together, proteins on the surface of the sperm and the egg have to interact with each other. And if their structures are different enough, they won't be able to interact with each other. So even though those gametes are in the same place and probably in physical contact with each other, they can't fuse because of the differences in the proteins on their surface. That's this notion of gametic isolation. All of these things occur before the zygote, but even after the zygote, as I had talked about, we can have these post-zygotic barriers, which all refer to differences in the reproductive ability of the hybrid that's produced from the reproductive event between the two species. So this is a liger. I could have just as easily gone with a mule. A liger is the offspring of a lion and a tiger, and they are infertile or sterile. Mules are the offspring of horses and donkeys. Very similar. This is a growler bear who is standing in here. It's a grizzly polar bear hybrid because it's got reduced vigor, meaning it's not well adapted for its environment. It doesn't survive to reproduce, even if it could reproduce. And then we can have what's called the hybrid breakdown or the loss of hybrid traits. So this is a cockapoo, which is a the product of the breeding of a cocker spaniel and a poodle. Uh, cockapoos, in order to be considered cockapoos, have to be the first generation of that cross. The minute you allow those cockapoos to breed, they'll start to breed out their hybrid characteristics and they'll go back towards looking like either a cocker spaniel or a poodle. I understand that dogs are all part of the same species, but this gets at the point, which is this notion that after that first generation, when you have subsequent rounds of reproduction, you can lose a lot of the hybrid traits. Certainly it works in dogs and it also occurs in nature where two closely related species are actually able to reproduce and, pr and produce an offspring who is relatively well adapted, even if that offspring then reproduces those, a lot of those hybrid traits will get lost. So these are our post zygotic barriers. I want to pause here and talk about one quick misconception. I'm going to start this video while we talk about it, and that's this notion that speciation has never been observed. Speciation absolutely has been observed, and it's being observed right now, both in the lab and in the world, in many different lineages of organisms. And this website, and I'll put a link to this website so that you can get there if you want to check it out, has a list of all of the speciation events that have been observed or have been studied over time, over the time that people have been looking for them. So it's an absolute misconception. And if you ever hear somebody saying that nobody's ever seen speciation occur, they are incorrect in that thought. So let's move on from here and let's talk about some of the examples of speciation that I can point to for you. And one example is the fly Regulettus pominella, which is a fly that originally lived entirely on hawthorn plants in North America. But when the apple was imported 
into North America, a population broke off from the hawthorn population and it started to live on the apple plants. Now hawthorns and apples don't flower at the same time of year, and that is totally connected to when regolettis engages in its reproductive cycle and so as a result over the last 200 or so odd years since the introduction of the apple these two populations have started to evolve away from each other to the point where if you bring them back into the lab and put them into the same area they will occasionally reproduce with each other but they prefer to reproduce with members of the population that is adapted to their particular plant of choice so here we see speciation in the process of occurring. And that's very similar to our second example from uh, the lab of Diane Dodd, who took a population of Drosophila or fruit flies and separated them out into two subpopulations, grew one population on a growth medium that contained starch as the sugar source, grew the other population on a growth medium that contained maltose as the sugar source, allowed that to go on for several generations. The nice thing about fruit flies is the generation time is about two weeks. So you could run this for 20 generations without really batting an eye, and then brought the populations back together and looked at who preferred to mate with who. And very similar to the regolettis situation that we just talked about, the Drosophila that were grown in the starch medium preferred to mate with the Drosophila that were grown in the starch medium, and the maltose Drosophila preferred to mate with each other. Again, there were some interbreedings. These were not separate species, but this shows how these speciation barriers can evolve and develop over time. And the last example that I'm going to talk about here is an example from the land of plants. That's a polyploidy example. So polyploidy refers to a genetic mutation that occurs where entire extra sets of chromosomes wind up in a cell. This is not something that animals can really tolerate, but plants can tolerate this quite easily. And so you can see this diagram of this polyploidy event. Instead of making gametes that had three chromosomes apiece for them to come together with, you wind up with a zygote that has twice the normal amount of chromosomes. This is actually really, really common in commercial fruits. The strawberries that you buy in the store can have as many as four times the normal number of chromosomes with the strawberries you'd find in the wild. Now, are the strawberries you find in the store and the strawberries you find in the wild separate species or not? It's not really important whether we want to rule them in or out. And none of these examples are really important whether we want to rule them in or out as distinctly separate species. Even though we have this biological definition of a species, it's important to understand that biology doesn't really care about how we might classify things. And when we're looking at something like a transition from one species to another, it's totally expected that we would see marginal cases as we watch this transition occur. So before we wrap up, I just want to talk a little bit about speciation through time. So this is a graph showing the number of discovered species and then estimates of the number of other species that remain to be discovered. And those estimates range all over the place, but you can see that, the, that it is thought that there are many species that have yet to be discovered. If we look at how speciation occurs through geological time, there's two models that we really use to get our head around this. One is what's called gradualism and the other is punctuated equilibrium. Gradualism is probably what you think of when you think of speciation, the accumulation of a lot of small changes over a period of time once a group is reproductively isolated from another group, which leads to the development of a species. Punctuated equilibrium is a little bit different. This is the idea that in a speciation event, the changes that lead to the development of the species occur relatively rapidly in a short period of time. And then you have a long period of time where there aren't a lot of changes until the next speciation event. So long periods of no change and then these short rapid periods of change. There's evidence for both in the fossil record and as we look at the rates of speciation over time, and it's not really important to worry too much about which one is quote unquote correct. These are just two different models for the process when we think about how speciation occurs over geological time. So that's it for our speciation video. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you can explain what a biological species is that you can describe the barriers that contribute to the reproductive isolation of a species, provide some examples of speciation that either have occurred or are currently occurring, and then compare the various models of speciation. If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment, write down any questions you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.